Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter is psoriasis. Very common skin problem um, next to eczema and allergic reactions. Six to 7.5 million people in the United States are affected. And so that means, if you do the math, probably about, what is that, 5% of our population or more. And that's just estimated those that are reporting. That's a lot of people with this uh, skin condition. Preventable, resolvable. Um, modern medical science and your doctors will tell you there's nothing we can really do for you but give you creams and salves and drugs. But I'm going to try to show you on a straight and narrow path how you can get rid of this and actually have more energy and feel better. What happens with psoriasis is there are really thick, scaly types of patches that form oftentimes on the elbows, on the scalps, um, gosh, all different, primarily you're going to see it a lot in the joint areas. So the knees, elbows, the butt sometimes, the back of the wrists are real common areas. We don't know why it focuses on that, but it tends to do that. And what happens is, is the new cells kind of pile up so fast in the replication that it's not, doesn't even allow enough time for the old cells to be gone, to be sloughed off. So cellular replication and proliferation can be 10 times can be up to a thousand times greater than the standard person if you cut yourself and the wound heals. Those cells will replicate 10 to a thousand times quicker. So you end up with these big, thick, patchy places and itching because the body's trying to get rid of that excessive amounts of skin. Um, there's also another form, we're not going to address this too much, um, in which blisters appear on the palms of the hands, uh, palms on the hands or the soles of the feet, and that will maybe save for another day. The root causes. Now, generally as a rule, from everything that I've experienced uh, and read, it is a fatty acid metabolism problem in the liver. That's one of the major things. But it tends to be genetically, in other words, if a person has psoriasis, there's about a 50% chance that someone, grandparent or a parent, also had psoriasis. So it may have to do something with how the liver processes fats or how the body bake, breaks down proteins. Because if you can't break down and digest proteins well, that also contributes to toxicity and psoriasis issues. Um, having low amounts or inadequate amounts of good fats in your diet and too much uh, fats that are inflammatory producing, like meat fats, french fry fats, trans fats, those all increase certain types of inflammatory prostaglandins, whereas things like fish, um, almonds, walnuts, pecans, slack soil, borage, all those kinds of things are essential fatty acids. The government tells us we need about 20 to 25 grams. So that would be four to five teaspoons a day of, of good fats. And I know very few people who are getting that in their diet right now. We've had other discussions about what these fatty acids do, but this is one of the major contributing factors to psoriasis. And I've seen tons of my customers that if we just modify and add essential fatty acids and get, in their, get their digestion working well, it goes away. So also there are certain medications, and there was a slew of medications that I ran across, too much for me to even list, that cause psoriasis. So anything that causes issues with the liver, chances are good it can be a contributing factor to psoriasis. But there are certain high blood pressure medications, blood thinners, things like that, that can contribute to psoriasis as well. Um, hormone function, hormone, I should say malfunctions, so DHEA, the lack of progesterone, estrogen, um, metabolites being excessive, all these types of things can also contribute to the body being inflamed and contribute to psoriasis. It seems as though people who have psoriasis tend to be more inclined to suffer from arthritis as well, which is obviously inflammatory by nature as well. The diet is kind of the most important thing that I can stress to you more than anything else, just about with anything that we ever discuss on our show. Best treated by eliminating toxins through the bowel and the urinary tract. That means you need to eat a diet high in fiber. Something called fruits and vegetables, a novel idea, huh? Some grains, but you need your five to six servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Um, in order to have healthy elimination and bowel. We try not to, if we can at all possible, not detoxify through the skin when you have psoriasis. We want to de detoxify through the urinary and the bowel tracts. Um, getting your proteins from fish and plant source proteins, your beans, your tofus, your fish, those types of things. You don't want a lot of milk. 
uh, or those types of what are called saturated fatty acids too much when you suffer from psoriasis. So um, I know with me, um, in order to keep inflammation down, you know, I'm allergic to milk, I do this rice protein mixture thing and it's a plant source based protein because I don't eat much meat because I don't want to be inflamed, I'm an athlete. Um, Whenever we talk about anything as far as detoxification through the bowel and the urinary system, that means drinking a glass of water every couple hours. And you're like, oh man, you know. But take the water with you, bottle wherever you go, make sure you drink in two of those 32 ounces a day in source of uh, water. I'm not saying juice, I'm saying water, because remember juice, lots of sugar. And so we prefer not to do a whole lot of juice, or if you do do it, dilute it. Um, Avoiding the junk foods and alcohol, anything that's very acidic or sugary, um, is, the liver has to go work overtime and it makes you kind of acidic as well, not kind of, makes you very acidic. And so you're going to have more of an issue with inflammation as well. So you got to get rid of the junk food and you got to get rid of the alcohol. Boy, I sound like a Puritan, don't I? Because bottom line is you got to eat clean. Um, if you have this disorder, those people who don't can get away with a little bit more, but if you want it gone, this is what you got to do. Avoid foods that trigger allergies. So if you know that you're allergic like me to certain things, like I have a sensitivity to chocolate, but I love it. And if I eat too much of it, I get inflamed. So I have to avoid it and I'm slightly sensitive and I have to keep it kind of out of my diet as best I can if I want to remain uh, not inflamed. Whole raw fruits and vegetables. Biggest thing in the thing. Planet. Oh, look what we did here. I think we're going to have to just switch this around real quick. This will just take me a second. Apologize for that. When we're talking about getting or preparing for detoxification because of psoriasis, oftentimes I know chiropractors or good naturopathic doctors will put people on what is called a detoxification. And that can involve a whole body cleanse, and you can buy those at your local good health food store. Um, you can look up online for various herbs and that type of thing as well. And I've got this for the cameraman, probably not real level, and I apologize for that. That's the first time I've ever done that. Um, also, you can fast on vegetable juices and herbal cleansing teas. And you can go into any good health food store, and you'll find them. They even say on there, herbal cleansing teas. But you can also go online and look up detoxification teas as well, too. The whole body cleanses are kind of interesting because they usually take two to four weeks. And what they do is they go in and they'll clean the bowel and they'll clean the organs and kind of get stuff moving again. And in the meantime, if you can eat a good diet at the same time with this, you can get rid of a lot of toxins through your bowel so it doesn't come through your skin with psoriasis. There's a lot of supplements that I could have listed on here. But I listed what I thought was the most important and the ones that have clinical double-blind placebo research. You know me, I like my research, I'm a scientist. So here we go, number one, flax or fish oil, one to two tablespoons per day. Oh yeah, I know you're thinking, oh my God. But I mix mine in my protein shake and so yeah, it's no big deal. But it really reduces inflammation and it helps with getting the good fats to the liver to reduce that uh, inflammation. There are studies, lots and lots of studies that support a reduction in all symptoms with psoriasis by utilization of these types of fatty acids. Make sure your fish oil is a clean source. Please don't go to your local department store or wholesale food store and go and buy yourself fish oil unless it says on there that it's mercury and PCP free. Very, very important. You want to sit there and take something and then poison yourself at the same time. Probiotics, the good bacteria, they aid in detoxification. Um, at least a four billion. What they do is they line the layer of the digestive tract and they allow you to break down your foods and eliminate toxins. And they allow you to produce certain hormones and your immune system and all kinds of things. But what it is is the food doesn't sit in there and rot. It literally will digest and move it along for you. Betaine hydrochloride um, or hydrochloric acid. This is a type of uh, stomach acid secretion that the body utilizes to increase the digestion of proteins, particularly when you're eating meat. So when I eat my once a day meat, or once every four day meat, um, I added a butane hydrochloride. Um, it breaks down the meats, 
Um, but obviously, you know when you take it, if you get a, like a kind of a real warm burning in your stomach, it's probably not for you. I tend to see it more, people that need it tend to be more A blood types or AB blood types. I know there's not a lot, a lot of science to back that up, but generally O's and B blood types tend to have adequate stomach acids until they tend to grow older from for about 40 onwards. So recognizing that if that meat sticks in your gut and doesn't digest well, you'd add betaine hydrochloride. Um, digestive enzymes, they help break down the food and they help skin tissue repair. Enzymes are required for every function in the body, including the repair of the skin. B12, studies support improvement just after six weeks. And if your doctor tells you you have to come in and get a B12 injection every two or three days, there are alternatives. You can do a sublingual, which melts into the tongue, which is about 1,000. You can get them in higher dosages, but at least 1,000 micrograms per day. B12 also helps with nervous system and some neuropathy issues. But the studies support, once again, a reduction in symptoms with psoriasis. Milk thistle extract. It's a liver detox and reduces cellular proliferation. In other words, it kind of modulates the replication of cells, um, what we call a, a modulator in our, in our um, industry. And milk thistle will help the liver with its enzymes. It just helps. It's one of the strongest antioxidants you get herbal-wise for the liver. Very helpful and beneficial for this particular disorder. Super green, green food supplements. Lots of greens, and there's things called superfoods, which are corella, spirulina, wheatgrass, alfalfa. They're very high in chlorophyll content and certain types of enzymes. And these superfoods alkali the blood, they oxygenate. They, honest to gosh, in addition, give you lots and lots of energy too. And when you oxygenate, guess what? Everything heals better on a cellular level, including your skin. Sarsaparilla. Now, the last time I remember having anything with sarsaparilla in it was in Calico, and it was a sarsaparilla soda at this old ghost town place I was at. But sarsaparilla really is an herb, and there's clinical data on herbs, and we don't sometimes see a whole lot, but it reduces the effects of bacterial toxins that aggravate psoriasis. So you can get it in any good um, health food store. Hard to find it in teas, but you can get it in capsules. A good multiple vitamin. Is there any time I don't have this down on a show? You need a good multiple vitamin. And once again, I'm not talking about something from your local grocer that has 15 to 17, and I can think of a couple of them, toxic substances in, it, in them and have a 3 to 5% absorption rate. You need a good multiple vitamin. Check out a good health food store that's got a lot of knowledge on the absorbability. There are comparative guides that tell us how absorbable these vitamins are when the companies are willing to submit it for an assay. And that makes a difference too. Vitamin C and quercetin are anti-inflammatory, anti-allergic response. They also help skin tissue repair. And I know when I had my bouts of eczema, boy, I'll tell you, it would stop my itching. And so if you're having an issue with that, I would probably increase the dosage of 1,000 milligrams on the vitamin C to like two or 3,000, two to three times a day, because it's a natural antihistamine and it does help with the itching. D3, is there a show in the last uh, six weeks that we haven't mentioned D? Um, oh my gosh, for H1N1, skin, bones, cancer, but it helps skin tissue repair. Obviously, we're in the sun, and I know we don't want to get a whole lot of sun, over amounts of sun rays, but honestly, with psoriasis, oftentimes, people spending 30 to 60 minutes, not from that 11 to 1 o'clock time, in the sun, ultraviolet light actually can help heal psoriasis, and there's studies that support and back that up as well. But vitamin D is an alternative for us, particularly here, like in Lompoc, San Inez Valley, and Santa Maria, where oftentimes it's a little too cold to be exposing everything. Um, zinc and copper. Zinc aids in healing, also helps with immune and immune modulation. You've got to balance it with a little bit of copper, however. Homeopathics. It's kind of funny. There's many homeopathics that help with this. Um, but one that I found, because I see a lot of it with my customers, in that they'll have emotional grieving from divorces and, and things like, you know, kids leaving home, going to college. I had somebody that's doing that. Um, there's a particular homeopathic that you can get in any good health food store in a 30C form uh, that can help with those, emo when the emotions start to make the, uh, the psoriasis worse, come in, grab it, put it under your tongue, and it really does work. 
There's clinicals on that as well. 30 minutes of exercise a day to get the circulation moving, to get the stress hormones down, because obviously we know stress is a contributing factor to just about every disease that's known to man. Get your doctor to test your hormones, your thyroid, your DHEA, find out your, whether you're absorbing your vitamin, um, vitamins and minerals, that full gamut, like we discuss on most of our shows. I wish most physicians would, uh, would be doing that, but oftentimes they're not, because it gives us a good idea where we're coming from and where the nutrient deficiencies occur. Hope this was helpful. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the fitness portion of our show, which is part two of our chakra clearing. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show, and as promised, we're going to be working on the second chakra today which has a lot to do with emotional well-being and balanced ego, creativeness. And so we'll pick up two exercises. If you can at least try to do one of them every day for the next uh, couple of weeks till our next show, I think it can be beneficial. Now, I kind of want to go through this list of when you're balanced and when you're not balanced. That way you can kind of get an idea and kind of be truthful with yourself if you can. I mean, all of us, all of us have faults, but... Being truthful with ourselves is the most important thing that we can do for ourselves. When you've got balanced energy, you're going to be creative. Your ego is balanced. You're not egotistical. You're um, imaginative. You're confident. You're independent. You're sensitive to other people's feelings. Uh, and they tend to have a, and you're optimistic, they tend to have a really good sixth sense uh, about them as well, when, or this energy when it's balanced. Now, when it's unbalanced, it's unconfident, frigid, abusive, um, constantly seeking sense pleasure, you want immediate gratification, um, self-indulgent, manipulative, and these people tend to be somewhat mean in their nature. So if you fall in that classification, let's do some extra work on the, on the second chakra. So let's get to business here. Second chakra move. Now if you have a bad lower back, this is not a move that you're going to be able to do. So what you're going to do is you're going to start in a down position if you have somewhat of a bad back and just kind of hold the position this way. If you're like me and you've got a good strong back, what you're going to do is you're going to put your hands here and you're going to come up and you're going to leave the arms slightly bent. We don't want to lock out the elbows and hold that position from anywhere from 10 to 60 seconds. And you can do it more than one time as well too if you choose. Next, second position. And I'm going to do this as tactfully as I possibly can because I want to help people. Um, this one actually can help with cramping as well, too. So for those of us that have daughters and granddaughters or ourselves, we can help people with this one. And what this involves is pushing your back all the way to the ground as best you can, you know, tilt it a little bit. And what you're going to do is you're going to kind of lift up and down and up and down. You're going to put your feet out with your little feet together here, hopefully the camera catches it. You can kind of rock back and forth maybe for like about 10 seconds. Try to hold the body still as best you can. And then each side three times. Okay, that, and you can do this movement um, several times and you can do it more than one time in a day. And I hope between the combination of those two or at least one of those, that can help you work on second chakra issues. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show, and I will be in an upright position. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you for the intro. Well, I'd like to start off with something that doesn't seem very health oriented, but actually quite is. And the headline reads, Rich People Don't Need Friends. Now, how does it apply to health? Well, I'm not trying to establish any economic or class warfare here, but you'll find some interesting things. Through the Journal of Psychological Science, they looked at six studies in regards to how wealth affects social acceptance and including pain. 
What they discovered is that money quickly becomes a substitute for social acceptance in conferring the ability to obtain benefits from the social system. Important thing to think about when you figure your government is full of multimillionaires. But the more interesting aspect is this, is basically when people handled money and they put their hands into hot water, they were able to endure the pain much longer from those people who were just handling paper. What to take from this? Well, small bruise, maybe rub a Washington or a Lincoln on it, break a leg, break out a Ben Franklin, make you feel all better. All right, after that, now we go to heart attacks. Something which some, you have to be, you know, more and more so is uh, people looking for answers and solutions for when they have them, if they get them. Well, in the September 14th edition of the Journal of Circulation, they discovered a substance called capsation, otherwise often found as an active ingredient in cayenne. When they rub that, that cream anywhere on the body, just as long as it's on the skin, it literally triggered defense reaction in the body that spared heart cells from dying. In fact, how many of them? 85% of those cells were protected from cardiac death. Capsation is something that's readily available. If a person has concerns regards to heart disease or heart ailments, not a bad thing to keep around since it does so much for so little. And it has no serious side effects. It can be a little hot to the skin. And ironically, a lot of you may already be using it because you're using your arthritis creams or anything for joint relief. And they believe, and they say, quote unquote, by activating these sensors in the nervous system via the skin, we think the response to preserve and protect the heart is triggered. They don't know how it happens, but it happens. Now, one of my favorite articles that came out, and yay for socialized medicine. Now you'll draw the connection here. You know, of course, when you have socialized medicine, your chances are you're going to have a shortage of doctors. And what a better thing to do when you have a shortage of doctors and to find a way to increase the labor pool without paying people more money. Well, one way you can do that is having untrained individuals do your surgery for you. Ironically, that is the headline. 75% would consider letting an unsupervised trainee perform surgery if it could be done quicker. Now, this came out of the, uh, this according to the survey from the BGUI that just came out of Britain. The responses were high regardless of how complex the surgery was. With 80% of those facing minor surgery and 68% of those facing major surgery say they would consider the suggestion. But often if you have the ability to do it, you will pick a trained person if it's available. However, if a trained person is not available, let's say for example you need heart surgery three months from now, but if you want a trained surgeon, it's going to take six months, three months, six months, yeah, go for the untrained supervised guy. The National Health Service consent forms, this is the problem, currently state that the hospital cannot say who will be performing the operation and only that the surgeon will be competent to perform the procedure. Surgeon does not necessarily mean credentialed any longer. My fun, my favorite part of the article is this. The authors say it's reassuring that patients understand the need for junior doctors to perform procedures as part of their training. It is also clearly time for consultant surgeons who allow unsupervised trainees to operate and reappraise that practice. Well, yeah, again, no rationing medicine, yay for socialized medicine. All right, cool. Now we go with the swine flu. Here is something that sounds kind of a repulsive, but there is an herb that was actually used in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, which actually works better than the Tamiflu or Oslover or whatever you want to call it, drugs we have today. It's called dung of the devil. The Latin name of it's called Frilla asafoetida. And this herb was actually shown, this is in the Journal of Natural Products, a monthly publication, September 25th, to outperform any of the current antiviral drugs that were out there. Quote unquote, chemical compounds in the extract of the plant showed greater potency against influenza A, H1N1, than a prescription antiviral drug available for the flu. Good medication, simple, cheap herb. If you can't get a hold of this stuff, it works better anyways. But keep in mind there's a caveat. As a research this medication, it is also used as a contraceptive and can induce abortions. So please, no pregnant women, take that. Now, back to vitamins. 
Now, I believe you're going to find the new vitamin K may become the new vitamin D, so to say. An important analysis conducted by Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute Science is just the importance of ensuring optimal diet, dietary intakes of vitamin K to prevent age-related disease conditions such as bone fertility, fragility, arterial and kidney calcification, cardiovascular disease, and possibly cancer. They basically, with the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, this issue of 2009, October, are coming up with an entire new theory in regards to vitamins. It's called the triage theory. For once, and this was proposed by Dr. Ames in 2006, the theory explains why disease associated with aging, like cancer, heart disease, and dementia, and the pace of aging itself may be unintended consequence and mechanisms during evolution to protect against episodic vitamin mineral shortages. If correct, the triage theory has widespread implications for public health because modest vitamin mineral deficiencies are quite common. And they go on to quote, average intakes, for example, of vitamin K, which they use for the study in the United States, are less than even the current recommended intakes. And gosh forbid you those guys, those of you which are on Coumadin. So if you're not doing a multivitamin by now, at least one form or another, your fate's in your own hands. Go for it. All right. After that, antioxidant called superoxidized dismutase. They discovered when they gave people this supplement called SOD, this is separate from the prior article, that it actually reduced stress. They looked at the antioxidant ability of stress reduction. SOD was so effective, so was the placebo, keep in mind that the placebo and the sod reduced stress levels in both groups in the first seven days. But the interesting thing about sod, superoxidase dismutase, the stress levels remained reduced for at least 28 days afterwards. Pretty amazing. That's from the Biomed Central Open Access Journal. Stress, check out soup, S-O-D. After that, back to hospitals. Popular stomach acids triple your risk of pneumonia. We've done this before and we we'll keep on doing it over and over again because a major warning coming out here. You get pneumonia in the hospital and you're on a ventilator, your chance of dying is one third. Now what they also discovered too, and this is what they said, that Zantac, Protonix, Prilosec, any of those increase basically your chance of pneumonia by altering the bacterial levels in the stomach which laid, leave you vulnerable to actually producing more of those bacterial and viral components, which could actually cause you to get pneumonia. Said, we conducted this study in part because we thought we were seeing more pneumonias than we're used to having, and they nailed it. So this came out of the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And after that, prior to last article, I'll have to cut a little bit short, swine flu vaccination subject, test subject speaks out. Now what happened was you have a lot of swine flu test subjects which are getting sick, they're not reporting it. Well, they found out because they're under tremendous pressure from the pharmaceutical industry and unfortunately I gotta cut this short. Thank you very much for that intro on that. Cool, sorry yeah. about that. We'd like to hear that, but we've got the 30 minutes. Thank you very much for joining our show. Once again, do your research for yourself, take your health into your own hands. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. <laughs>